welcome my amazing viewers thank you so much for joining me on my program once again i appreciate you wherever you are connecting from if you have not subscribed to my channel please kindly subscribe to my channel click the notification bell so that you be notified each time i upload a video you will be among the first to receive it thank you so much and remember bless Welcome back. You're watching Hard Copy coming to you from our studios in Abuja. Our guest tonight is Professor Kenneth Ameshi, who is a leading scholar on sustainable business and finance in the Global South. He's the Chair in Business and Sustainable Development and Director Scaling Business in Africa at the University of Edinburgh. He's also the Chair in Sustainable Finance and Governance at the European University Institute in Florence. He also serves on a part-time basis as the economic advisor to the Imo State Governor. Let's talk about the Southeast. The Southeast has now a peculiar challenge. Um, it started gradually in terms of agitations to be included into the polity before you knew what was happening. It has now started as agitations for an entire entity, uh, a separate entity. And the, the method of agitation is such that it is beginning to affect the economy of the Southeast in terms of investors coming in there and also even the investors that are there and the economic activities of the people, the sit at homes haven't exactly helped either. Um, from where you sit, when you, when you speak with the governor of the state who has also had his own personal challenges, um, what are some of the things, what are some of the pictures you're pa painting with you know, particular regard for the Southeast? Um. As someone who is living in Scotland, uh, I'll be very naive to say people are not entitled to uh, question their identity and also how they participate in a country. So uh, my point, I mean, the, there are people who argue that Nigeria is non-negotiable. I don't completely subscribe to that. Uh, I believe that there is need for us to have informed discussions. Uh, and if a part of Nigeria is um, agitating, to, you know, they must have their reasons. But um, it has to be followed in a sensible manner. I also believe that uh, we don't necessarily need another war. Um, we can um, discuss peacefully and dialogue peacefully and get the things we want. And again, that's where the quality of education comes in, because if you have good education, then it will help us to uh, position some of these things in a very logical sense. And if I disagree with you, it's not that I hate you, or it's not that fact that I don't want you to survive or live. So my advice in, in that sense, and what I've continued to champion of late, is more of regional development. And uh, is the thinking I'm bringing to bear to my work uh, in Imo State. Uh, I've also done some work around Africa capitalism, and Africa capitalism is how Africans can truly develop themselves. And if I look at it from that perspective, I can see the fact that there is a link. You know, so whether we are starting from Imo State uh, through the Southeast, through Nigeria, through West Africa, to Africa, it, it's, 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 it, you know. that, that's something I've heard uh, Mr. Tony Lumelu espouse: Africa capitalism. Uh, where he says, you know, I mean, he has seen him uh, do that with a foundation where, you know, small businesses are given grants and, you know, see what can become of the many entrepreneurs that are produced as a result of that. Is that also what you mean by it? Yes, I mean, uh, back in 2015, Tony Lumelu Foundation uh, sponsored the research uh, I led at the University of Edinburgh in collaboration with other, other universities. And the idea then was to... Um, give some intellectual grounding to the concept of African capitalism and uh, we now developed it to the point where it's not just only for business but it can also apply to politics, uh, it can apply to uh, other entities, uh, even the civil society. So it's about Africans working collaboratively towards the development of Africa but in also in a way that recognizes African values, African worldviews. Um, so from a business perspective, you can think about the private sector contributing to the development of Africa. But you can also take that thinking into industrial policy because um, government will need to create an enabling environment for that kind of entrepreneur to flourish. What sort of tax incentive can be granted to an entrepreneur who is keen to contribute to Africa's problem? Yeah, but I'm just wondering, I mean, look, looking at what Imo State in particular, I mean, I've seen in, in, in Anambra, um, the, you know, they have their own peculiar challenge. Only recently we saw the governor of Anambra visit uh, Namdi Kanu in, the D in DSS custody in the hope that uh, the, the uh, 
the manner of agitation will change in the southeast. Uh, but shortly after, we saw what happened, I mean, Idimili, North Local Government Area, where cars were burnt and the entire local government building was brought down. I mean, that happened there. In, the, in Imo State, you have also faced, the state has also faced its own challenge in terms of, uh, you know, security, security vehicles, security houses, prisons, and what have you. Even the governor's hometown was also brought down by agitators, in quote. And we've seen more and more, you know, security being at the forefront. How do you tell people that, you know, business is now going to be safe or that entrepreneurship will be the way to go when it will seem that, you know, there's been no settlement with regards to security and, and, and with the polity in general? Yeah, I mean, these are fair points, but what I also argue is that um, it's a vicious cycle. Where do you start from? Uh, uh, one of the points I made earlier is that unemployment is at the heart of you know, the insecurity challenge in, in Nigeria, even in, in, uh, in Africa and other parts of the world. So how do we break that cycle, vicious cycle? For me, one way is for businesses to think about how they can use their power to create uh, good jobs. But you don't need to be in Imo State, for example. You don't need to be in uh, Anambra or the Southeast. But because think about your value chain. Think about your supply chain. I'll give you an instance. At the moment, I'm, I'm trying to develop a concept I call the Corporate Imo Impact Partnership. And here I'm looking at companies that are not based in Imo State, but that have their value chains extended to Imo State. All Imo State. of this is in an environment where you have acknowledged that there is poor education and, and that you think that, that should be a priority. I mean, are you linking that with the uh, proposals which you are coming up with? Of course. I mean, uh, when it comes to empowerment, you, you can look at two, two angles for it in terms of skills, uh, education and the skills required and employability. I mean, are they ready for, for the market? So um, we will look at the root cause or causes of this and then think of how the different companies can help contribute to this. Um, there are people who may not have your formal education, but they can also be empowered through informal work. Um, say, for example, we identified in Imoste that fabrication you know, is one of the key things that can support, um, that can create jobs. Uh, because you have the oil and gas companies there. Uh, Innocent, for example, is thinking of going into Imoste. So we need a lot of fabrication. Imoste is not far from our bar. Uh, we so and it's very much well positioned. So you, you can do you can do a lot more uh, around that. Um, the other bit is also a digital economy. Uh, and when you go there, you hear this whole notion about young people who uh, take survey, but they may not be using technology in the good sense. So the idea now is how do we rechannel that energy, useful energy and, and exuberance into something that is much more positive by tapping into the digital economy. Uh, i give you an instance. I mean, I have somebody based in Lagos who does my graphic work in Edinburgh. But he is in Lagos, like, and, and the job he does um, are great in, in, to a large extent, uh, comparable to what you find in, in Edinburgh or any other European city. But he's based in Lagos. How can we create such jobs and opportunities for people in Imo State, in the Southeast, who are equally gifted to tap into this global economy that is worth uh, millions of dollars? So you don't need to travel. It will have implications for migration. Because what, one of the things also we suffer in the Southeast is brain drain. You, do you think that I will be able to? Yes, indeed. I mean, you're one of the people who's left, but thankfully <laughs> you're coming back somewhat. Um, do you think that I would also address the agitations and perhaps even the manner of agitation because the seated homes are still there. Um, if, you, if the number of work days are reduced, there's very little time to do much. Yeah, the, the, the problem there, um, I'm trying to stay away from it, okay? but if I'm to first confront it, and I mean, that's part of what we are doing here, having a frank conversation, uh, you ask yourself, do people sit at home because they love the idea or they sit at home because they are afraid, they want to minimize their own risk? If you ask me, um, I would say people sit at home because they want to minimize their risks. Okay? Um, they also appreciate that um, um, there's a bit of suffering going on here. And even the people we are thinking to punish through sit at home may not be feeling it. If somebody's in Abuja and you're in the southeast sitting at home, how does that affect? And the person in Abuja is you know, doing, going about his or her business. And some of the people who are also calling for this sit at home may not necessarily be in Nigeria. So wherever they are, they are also working for their livelihood. So the people in, and for those also who are in the southeast who may have access 
to say, well, digital uh, technologies may sit at home and still be earning. So who are the people who are truly suffering from this? These are people who go out on a daily basis to work with their hands, to sell, to trade. And these are the same people also that um, we are trying to save. So if you look at it from that perspective, you can see that it's a double dilemma and uh, in a, an increased burden on the people who want to save. And I think any good government, any good leader, anyone who is thinking of a country, to them consider the, the, the most vulnerable and, and the weakest in the society. And how you treat the weakest in your society also reflects the kind of uh, values and society you want to create. Professor Kenneth Amisha, thank you so much for coming on Hard Copy. To coordinate and organize our people, there are no governors who are working. If our governors were working, Namdekan will not see a vacuum to fill. That is the problem. We, look the, the, we leave the main problem and start talking about, uh, you know, declaring sit at home. Why shouldn't there be sit at home? If people don't want to sit at home, no, does anybody go to harass them? Even since they made the announcement people should be going to work, out of fear, people should sit at home. They have made it known that it's only the day they will take him to court that they will ask people to sit at home. And I tell you, people are gladly sitting at home. They are not anything. gladly sitting at home. I've sampled a, a whole lot of opinion. People who think that the economy of the South East is being battered. How do by we, that, we, that we, that can, we can afford to lose that, to make a point? That's the only way we can make a point now. Because this country has not recognized the contributions of the in this country. They have not. If not, tell me how the government will be talking about, uh, there's a, a word they use, to dominate that he has issued instruction to the military to dominate Anambra State during the election. Do you know what dominate means? Overwhelm, intimidate. That is even more serious than what iPod is talking about. Because now most people will not be prepared to come out seeing rows and armored tanks and everything moving around. Because that's the meaning of dominate. We know security is important, but to use the word dominate, which the National Security Advisor re-emphasized. And to start with, we are talking about discrimination. Do you know? The National Security Council just met and took that decision. In that National Security Council, not one human being from the whole of former Eastern region. Not one human being. That is part of what Namdekan is talking about. Injustice, lack of inclusion. Not one human being. Because we are not in the... But, but Chief Dan, just, just a second. We are not in the service, uh, any of the service distance. We are not security advisor. We are not chief of staff. We are nothing. They couldn't even invite... They have two lucky lackeys in the, in the South East. They would have called the governor of Imo State to come and tell them, theoretically, what is it that is happening as a basis of their decision taken. So in the National Security Council, where the decision was taken to dominate Anambra election, there was no Igbo man there. Not one. You knew I was, con uh, uh, what do you call it? I was kidnapped on the 26th of yes. last month yes. and held for about three, four hours before they released me and took my vehicle and every other thing. And I had courage to ask. I was saying the blood of Jesus. I saw young men carrying brand new AK-47 rifles, intimidating myself and my driver. And I got annoyed. I said, God, I've, I'm above 70. I've lived the better part of my life. And I promise you I'll continue saying the truth until I die. And I asked them, what the hell do you think you're doing? He said, if I talk again, you'll kill me. I said, you can't kill me. And the young man stopped his vehicle. And I said, I said, you can't kill me because I'm covered with the blood of Jesus. You can't kill me. I said, 50 years ago, I was almost a major in Biafran Army. And he, he almost wept. Oh, God, did you serve in Biafran Army? I said, yes. If we knew this, we wouldn't have taken off this job. The problem is coming for your own environment. If we knew that you helped to save our people. And I almost wept. And they said, nothing will happen to you and your driver. And they dropped us off. About 30 minutes after that. They told us that most of the violence were imported, that they are being paid to go and destroy their own properties from outside, so that they create a problem as Igbos are doing something wrong. Our people have value for life. Igbos have value for life, more than any other tribe in this country. And I make, I, 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 I make good to say it anywhere. Because anybody who goes around this country investing does not hate this country. There was a time I was in one of your programs, you were around from 9 to 10 o'clock. Then, then my friend uh, Ibrahim Dankwambo was governor of uh, Gombe State. I had a one-hour program. And I said, can any other tribe tell me who, which tribe has made any contribution to the development of this country, to the patriotism of this country more than Igbos have done? There's no part of this country you go 
and you don't see any Boma making an investment. Come to the whole of Eastern region. You don't see an Hausa man with one property. I said it on TV. And not, not one person. The governor called me. The Northern governor summoned an emergency meeting in Kano and discussed my, my, my program. I said, you see an Hausa man, he's selling currency in Atowere Road. You don't know when he comes in and when he goes. If you see a Yoruba man, he's a uh, labor, the tailoring service. They won't even buy an empty land. But an Igbo man comes to your place, buys land, develops it, makes sure they build a school. Igbo State Union build a college in Kano in the 50s that everybody was going to school. Is that hatred? Do we hate this country? Why do they hate us so All much? Right, just Thank you so much for your patience to watch from the beginning to the end. I hope you have learned something from the video you have just watched. The video you have just watched is to bring information to your doorstep and for educational purpose. It is not to demonize anybody. Let us watch continuously and see who can be able to make a sense out of every nonsense we are seeing. We must continue. We move. It doesn't matter what they do. It doesn't matter what they say. They will kill us. We will kill them. At the end of the day, Biafra is here. Thank you for watching. If you have not subscribed to the channel, please kindly subscribe to the channel. Click the notification bell so that you are notified each time I upload a video. You will be among the first to receive it. Thank you and remain blessed. Bye bye. See you again.